A former reporter with Politico.com and Washington City Paper, he won the 2007 Alt Weekly Award for Best Long Form Nonfiction. He lives in Washington, D.C., and he likes it. Um, please join me in welcoming Ryan Grimm. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming out. This is quite a thrill. Um, How is that? Can everybody hear me? Better? OK, great. So this book, this book started about five years ago when uh, I was at uh, grad school at the University of Maryland. And I was studying public policy, but we were allowed to take one class outside of our discipline. And I, I decided to take a, a class in journalism. And the professor assigned what's known in the industry as a trend story. Go out there and find a trend. Uh, the first thing that occurred to me was everybody is playing poker nowadays. And then I thought to myself, I, I don't want to write about poker. What do you say about poker after like the third line? So then I thought to myself, wait a minute. I haven't seen any acid in like three years. <laughs> I looked into it a little bit, not much, because I was in you know, my first journalism class. I didn't know much what I was doing. Uh, wrote the story up, and uh, the professor said, you know what, if this is true, that you can't find any acid, then you should be able to prove it, and then you should be able to publish this story. So uh, that's, that's where this book came from. Um, and it, it, uh, it evolved into an exploration of what makes drugs either disappear or reduce in uh, availability or become more popular. And then from there, it became you know, an exploration of, you know, of what we do as Americans um, in order to uh, keep our sanity and sometimes lose it in terms of our drug policy. So let me start uh, very near the beginning. At some point, I decided that the disappearance of acid was nearly, if not totally, complete. I went to see a professor in my department, Peter Reuter, one of the most well-respected drug policy researchers in the nation. Acid is gone, I told him. How'd you come to this theory, he asked. I can't find it, I said, and none of my friends can either. I knew I sounded like a fool, but that's all I had. That's not how we do things in this field, he said. Drug availability goes in cycles. That's not really a series of trends, that's just how it is. He pointed to a book behind me. Here, hand me that. He opened the 2002 Monitoring the Future report which is produced by the University of Michigan and tracks drug use among American teens. As you'll see, he said, running his finger across the LSD table, use has been fairly steady over the last, he paused and looked up. That's interesting, he said, looking at the data for high school seniors. LSD use is at an historic low, 3.5%. He then regrouped and continued with his lecture, telling me about supply and demand in peaks and valleys, and that he was certain the numbers for acid would rise in the 2003 survey. Drug cycles are widely presumed to be the result of a combination of cultural shifts and the effectiveness of drug interdiction, but they're generally not well understood. Supply and demand, however, inarguably play a large role. When a, drug's becomes, when a drug becomes scarce, its price increases, enticing producers and distributors to invest more heavily in it, which increases supply, Reuter explained. I told him I wasn't so sure. There simply was no acid out there, and there hadn't been for several years. I rambled on about the end of the Grateful Dead and the collapse of giant raves. He was unmoved. Check the 2003 numbers, he said. They may be online by now. If levels remain the same, then you've got something. The 2003 numbers had just come out. I checked annual LSD use. It was at 1.9%, nearly a 50% drop. I checked a, few other, I, I checked a few other sources. Evidence of acid's decline could be found practically everywhere in the following statistics in an ongoing federal survey of drug use, in the number of emergency room cases involving the drug, in a huge drop in federal arrests for LSD. I took the numbers back to Reuter. This isn't a trend, he said. This is an event. Like all drugs, acid is a bellwether of American society. Its effect on our culture in the 60s and 70s was immeasurable, and its disappearance in the early years of the 21st century was limited to the United States. Cultural commentators who look for trends in unemployment numbers, presidential approval ratings, or car and housing purchases are missing something fundamental if they don't also consider statistics on drug use. Little tells us more about the state of America than what Americans are doing to get high. Life in the United States, of course, is similar in many ways to life anywhere in the developed world. But our nation diverges sharply from the rest of the world in a few crucial ways. 
Americans work hard, 130, 135 hours a year more than the average Briton, 240 hours more than the typical French worker, and 370 hours, that's nine weeks, more than the average German. We also play hard. A global survey released in 2008 found that Americans are more than twice as likely to smoke pot as Europeans. 42% of Americans had puffed at one point. Percentages for citizens of various European nations were all under 20. We're also four times as likely as Spaniards to have done coke, and roughly 10 times more likely than the rest of Europe. Quote, we're just a different kind of country, said the US drug czar's spokesman, Tom Riley, when asked about the survey. We have higher drug use rates, a higher crime rate, many things that go with a highly free and mobile society. Different indeed. There, there may be no people on earth with a more twisted and complex relationship to drugs. Much of our preconceived, much of our preconceived self-image turns out to be wrong. Libertine continentals have nothing on us in terms of drug use, and American piety hasn't prevented us from indulging. In fact, it has sometimes encouraged it. Much of our conventional wisdom about American drug use, that the Puritans and the members are, of our founding generation were teetotalers or mild drinkers, that the drug trade is dominated by huge criminal organizations such as the Mafia and the Bloods, that crack use has declined significantly since the 80s, turns out to be wrong too. If there's one certainty about American drug use, it's this. We're always looking for a better way to feed our voracious appetite for getting high, for something cheaper, faster, less addictive, or more powerful. Drug trends feed themselves as word spreads about the amazing new high that's safe and non-addictive. Then we discover otherwise and go searching for the next great high. We often circle back to the original drug, forgetting why we quit in the first place. And one thing I argue in the book is that you can't take, first you can't take drug policy in isolation. Uh, you have to, because economic policy, trade policy, uh, foreign policy, healthcare policy, everything affects uh, the use of drugs more really than, uh, than drug policy does. The other thing I argue is that you also can't isolate specific drugs because people are getting inebriated broadly. They're not just looking for one particular type of drug. So if you succeed in tamping down one drug, they're going to find something else because, and dealing with it in those silo ways is ineffective. Here's one, uh, one example of that happening, and we start uh, in the late 70s. Perfect, thought Keith Stroop as he put down the phone after a call from Griffin Smith, a speechwriter for President Jimmy Carter. Smith had invited Stroop to his apartment at the Watergate, where he needed some help composing a presidential statement on drug policy. Stroop was a pro-pot lobbyist running the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, normal. Drug culture, it seemed, was about to go mainstream. Quote, he and I were about the same age and had smoked together, Stroop recalled from his K Street office where he still heads the organization. I said, whoa, and I grabbed my best stuff and headed over there. Indeed, it was Stroop who came up with Carter's most memorable formulation of his liberal drug policy. Quote, penalties against possession of a drug should not be more damaging to an individual than the use of the drug itself. We ended up with a statement that I thought was awfully good, said Stroop. Even though they toned the statement down, it is still to this day the best statement any president has had on marijuana. The 1977 meeting wasn't public knowledge, but even if it had been, America's, America's relationship with drugs was such that the idea of pro-marijuana advocates consulting with the White House would have drawn little protest. Marijuana use had risen steadily through the 60s in, t in tandem with the countercultural revolution. Quote, by the time we started going to the anti-war demonstrations between 65 and 68, said Stroop, one of the things we noticed was there was a lot of marijuana smoking. It was a way to let the news people covering the protests know that yes, we were there primarily to protest the war in Vietnam, but there were a lot of other things about the government we opposed as well, and one of them was its marijuana laws. Drugs were the counterculture's consolation prize. Instead of a quick end to the Vietnam War, a new egalitarian society, or even a democratic president, President Richard M. Nixon's war on drugs had been aborted when he resigned in 1974. Though Nixon had explicitly sought to divide the country along cultural lines in order to rule, his successor made healing the national psyche his highest priority. President Gerald Ford both pardoned Nixon and granted conditional amnesty to draft dodgers, actions that were together the essence of 70s detente. Across America, mainstream acceptance, or at least tolerance, of drug, drug use and drug culture was evident. Head shops publicly selling drug paraphernalia, sometimes thinly labeled as for tobacco use only, 
were as common as Annie Ann's pretzels are today. News reports gradually became more favorable toward marijuana, and the attitude of the general public and legislators alike tended toward a pro-pot stance. In 1973, Oregon became the first state to decriminalize pot, making possession of under an ounce a civil offense akin to speeding. Two years later, California followed. In 1978, Nebraska brought to 11 the number of states that had decriminalized possession of small quantities of the drug. Tens of millions of people were living in places where smoking pot was effectively legal. Half of the high school seniors polled by the University of Michigan in 1974 said that they had smoked marijuana in the, past, in the last year. But there was little public outcry about any kind of epidemic. As early as 1972, a commission had recommended to Richard Nixon that pot be decriminalized nationwide. He rejected the advice, but three years later, Carter campaigned under a promise to do just that. Quote, at that time, virtually everyone in the California pot movement thought we'd already won, recalls Jack Herrera in the dedication of the cult classic, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. They'd begun to drift away from the movement and, and had gone back to their lives, thinking the battle was over and that the politicians would clean up the loose ends. In the midterm elections following Nixon's resignation, the American people elected 49 new Democrats to the House of Representatives, creating a huge majority. Democrats also picked up four Senate seats, meaning that they had gained virtually dictatorial power in Congress. When Carter moved into the White House, Democrats had fully consolidated power. The GOP hollered here and there about rising pot use and the perennial scourge of heroin, but without control of either branch of the government, it was essentially powerless. It was in this context that Stroop and Smith sat down to craft Carter's drug policy, and in which, a year later, Peter Bourne, Carter's top, dr top drug official, sat down to blow lines at a 1977 normal Christmas party with Stroop, Hunter S. Thompson, and an assistant to newspaper columnist, Jack Anderson. It's no surprise that Coke was their drug of choice. Rapidly gaining in popularity among the educated elite, cocaine was in its honeymoon, honeymoon phase, again. And just as in the previous century, its rise was facilitated by circumstances aligning against another drug. This time around, the drug wasn't demon rum, but rather a substance that American culture was on the very verge of declaring respectable, marijuana. I clearly fucked up, Stroop told me. The coke session with the drug czar, which had gone down at, the, at a Georgetown home, had been strictly private. But to get to it, Bourne and his companions had had to walk up a spiral staircase in full view of the entire party. Stroop, Hunter Thompson, and the government's drug man all ascending together made an interesting threesome. Word inevitably leaked out. In fact, Anderson broke the story, with Stroop agreeing to be quoted in the Washington Post. He was subsequently forced out of normal and not allowed to return until many years later. Carter, deeply embarrassed, never again entertained decriminalizing marijuana or any other liberal drug policies. Stroop narked because he was pissed. While speaking softly about drugs at home, Carter had been vigorously prosecuting the drug war abroad. Well before the scandal broke, Stroop and Bourne had been feuding over a carcinogenic chemical being sprayed on Mexican pot by the Drug Enforcement Administration. It was supposed to kill the plants, but growers learned that if they harvested their crops immediately after they were sprayed, their pot would still at least appear normal. Pot smokers across the country were getting sick and normal as their, as their largest consumer protection group lobbied to have the spraying stopped. Bourne refused, and the rejection played some part in Stroop's outing him to the post. The spraying, the spraying was part of Operation Condor, a joint Mexican-American venture aimed at eradicating Mexican pot that had been going on since 1975. General Jose Hernandez Toledo, fresh from the 1968 student massacres in Mexico City, led tens of thousands of soldiers into the hills of Sinaloa, Durango, and Chihuahua. Quote, tons of drugs were destroyed, Production was reduced, prices rose, but drugs continued to flow into the American market, although in lesser quantity of Mexican origin, writes sociologist Luis Astorga in the paper Drug Trafficking in Mexico, a first general assessment. The action had several consequences. One, a rise in the price of pot in the United States was intended. Others were not. The growth, during the se the growth of domestic marijuana farming might have erased pot shortages slightly during the 70s, but the industry was hardly the high-tech, high-efficiency, bud-producing machine it is today. The encouragement of a shift from pot to cocaine importation among drug smugglers was a much more significant development in the short term. Coke, more valuable by weight and with a less detectable odor, 
was more profitable and much easier to, and much easier to move. A minor player in the coke trade in the 70s, Mexico would a decade later come to rival the Caribbean. By the late 90s, it would dominate the industry. As domestic pot production began to take off in Northern California, the quality of homegrown marijuana available to Americans was steadily improving. Ken Kesey's former girlfriend and the future wife of Jerry Garcia, Carolyn Adams, the Carolyn Mountain Girl Adams, was among the first to grow gourmet bud in Northern California in the early 70s. Some Vietnam vets who had picked up a taste for drugs while fighting communists were happy to employ camouflage and, bo and booby trapping skills learned in the Asian jungle in the forests of Northern California. And as they followed Adams's lead, U.S. pot farming was allowed to expand with near impunity. Neither California Governor Jerry Brown nor the Carter administration was particularly concerned with going after West Coast growers. Brown smoked pot himself, and he was almost brought down by it when, at the behest of federal agents, Timothy, Timothy Leary's wife, hoping to free her husband from prison in the 70s, shared a joint with Brown in an entrapment scheme. She ultimately decided not to cooperate, saving Brown's political career, which continues to this day. Hmm. A little warm up here. Uh, the DEA, for its part, had no clue as to how much marijuana was being grown in the United States. In 1984, the agency estimated that domestic annual production was 2,100 metric tons and represented only 12% of total consumption. Government officials, quote, were still screaming about all these dynamite, super strength strains of Mexican marijuana when we had moved on to Canadian or tie sticks or stuff people grew domestically, said Stroop. Their continued preoccupation with imported marijuana gave the domestic industry a chance to get on its feet. The American marijuana market, however, remained dependent on imported and outdoor herb, both of which are susceptible to shortfalls. Pot grown outdoors is harvested in the fall, meaning that by summer, supply would be depleted nationwide. Combined with foreign eradication efforts, these seasonal shortages helped open the door for cocaine as users substituted an available drug for an unavailable one. Quote, without question, in the mid to late 70s, there were frequently months where even working at normal, we would, have, we would have a drought, said Stroop, but there was never a shortage of cocaine because it didn't have anything to do with the growing season. Sometimes I'd go to my dealer and he didn't have any marijuana, but he always had cocaine. So while, uh, while the nation is becoming infatuated with cocaine, particularly coming through Miami, the uh, American people turn their attention to, to marijuana, particularly in the uh, in the form of Ronald Reagan when he come when he comes into office, federal federal survey data show that coke use among 18 to 25 year olds doubled from 1977 to 1979. By the end of the decade, 40 percent of Americans in that age bracket admitted to trying the drug. If present trends go unchecked, prophesied in 1979 DEA report. A vast new youth market for the substance could be reopened, could be opened. High cost, rather than restricted availability, will remain the principal deterrent to regular use among less affluent persons. His, uh, historian, Christopher, historian Christopher Lash's 1979 book, The Culture of Narcissism, American Life in an Age of Diminishing Expectations, captures the mood of those who made up this vast new market. To live for the moment is the prevailing passion. To live for yourself, not for your predecessors or posterity, he writes. We are fast losing the sense of historical continuity, the sense of belonging in a succession of generations originating in the past and stretching into the future. It is the waning of the sense of historical time, in particular the erosion of any strong concern for posterity that distinguishes the spiritual crisis in the se of the 70s. Nothing creates a more narcissistic high than cocaine, and post-Watergate, Mistrustful Americans were more inclined to listen to themselves than to the government when it came to drug use. They lied to us about pot, the thinking went. Why should we believe them about coke? Timothy Leary, whose bizarre career trajectory placed him at the heart of the American counterculture for decades on end, popped up again as a defender of the powder. Obviously, cocaine is the drug of the day, he told an interviewer in the early 80s. It is well adapted to our times. Of course, the narcs who are cracking down who are cracking down on its use rant and rave about the dangers of the miserable substance, which is, in reality, a harmless substance. It's a drug that causes euphoria, quite ple pleasant and sparkling like champagne. You feel powerful, as if you controlled the world, and intelligent, much more than you actually are. 
I've never turned down cocaine, he added, except after midnight if I want a good night's sleep. The, na the nation's new enthusiasm for the drug was positively 19th century. Harvard University drug expert Dr. Lester Grinspoon testified at a 1979 congressional hearing that, quote, people, generally speaking, don't use cocaine quite as recklessly as they did at the turn of the century and are more sophisticated about their use of it. At present, chronic cocaine abuse does not commonly appear as a medical problem. Users, he said, were, quote, not very much at risk. That same year, High Times, which had been solely dedicated to pot, was running ads for, quote, cocaine kits. The magazine showed readers how to heat coke and smoke the vapors. In Colombia, said the ad, quote, the natives call their, call their snow vapor base. For over 100 years, in every village, it's been the toke of the town. Carter's own drug, uh, top drug policy official, Bourne, saw little danger in cocaine, writing in a 1976 article that coke, quote, is probably the most benign of illicit drugs currently in widespread use. At least a strong case could be made for legalizing it as for legalizing marijuana. Short acting, about 15 minutes, not physically addicting, and acutely pleasurable, cocaine has found increasing favor at all socioeconomic levels in the last year, unquote. Then comes Reagan. We're making no excuses for drugs, hard, soft, or otherwise, pronounced Reagan on June 24th, 1982. A veteran of many pitched pissing contests with the counterculture while governor of California in the late 60s, he was eager to take it on again when he became president. Drugs are bad and we're going after them. As I've said before, we're taking down the surrender flag and running up the battle flag. We're going to win the war on drugs. Reagan redoubled efforts at curbing imports, further militarized drug policy, and brought about mandatory minimum sentences for minor drug offenses. In 1980, the FBI's Uniform Crime Report listed fewer than 100,000 arrests for heroin and cocaine, which were tabulated together. By 1989, that figure had jumped to more than 700,000. But the first battle Reagan would fight in his war was against marijuana, which required laying siege to the once ignored base of liberal resistance, Northern California. His campaign against marijuana production began in the harvest season of 1983. U-2 spy planes and military helicopters flew over the Golden, Golden State looking for green crops. By the, fall, corn, by the fall, corn, wheat, soybeans, and the like have turned brown, making cannabis easy to spot from the sky. The DEA reported seizing 64,579 plants with an estimated value of $130 million. Federal law enforcement figures marched in the streets chanting, War on Drugs, War on Drugs. The opposition printed, bump, printed bumper stickers demanding U.S. out of Humboldt County. The 1984 hall was three times larger. Nationally, pot plant seizures rose from about 2.5 million in 1982 to more than 7 million in 1987, an amount that rivals the government's previous estimate of the entire domestic crop. Reagan even began to go after, quote, ditch weed, a wild variety of hemp that has no potential to get a user high. The first year that the White House kept data for ditch weed eradication, it claimed to have uprooted about 9 million plants. That number was up to more than 120 million by 1989 and reached half a billion in 2001. Unsurprisingly, such sustained effort drove up the price of marijuana. The DEA closely tracks drug prices and purity, although it doesn't often make the data available publicly. It did so most recently in 2004, and the numbers include a startling, if misunderstood, observation. Quote, the marijuana price trends are not highly correlated with trends in prices of other drugs over time, the report reads. While the price of powder, heroin, and to a lesser extent, crack were falling during the 1980s, the average price of marijuana generally rose, unquote. An eighth of an ounce of pot in 1981 was going for $25 in 2002 figures. It stayed roughly the same in 1982. By 1986, it was up to $53 and it hit a high of $62 in 1991, a 150% rise over 10 years. Coke, meanwhile, became much more affordable. It cost nearly $600 a gram in 1982. As Reagan directed resources toward the pot battle, Coke's price began to tumble. By 1989, it was down to $200 a gram, cheaper in real terms than it had been during the last National Coke binge a century earlier. At the same time, average purity levels nearly doubled. Clearly, the price trends are highly correlated, but the correlation is a negative one. In the 80s, price increases in marijuana drove demand toward other drugs. 
The war on drugs, hard, soft, or otherwise, helped persuade pot smokers to put down the bong and pick up the pipe, the mirror, or the needle. Pot smoking plummeted under Reagan. About half of 12th graders in 1979 told the University of Michigan researchers they had smoked pot that year, the same as five years before. The numbers fell through the 80s and dwindled to one-fifth of 12th graders in 1992. The use of other drugs either, either stayed the same or increased as people started looking for a different, different cheap high. Reported use of inhalants nearly doubled from 19, from 19, between 1981 and 1987. Cocaine, heroin, and meth use all rose in the 80s. Heroin dropped in price by a third between 81 and 88. By 96, it had dropped by two-thirds. The price of crack was falling as well. The DEA started tracking it only in 1986, around the time the, the drug's use became widespread. Its price fell by about half over the next five years. In rural areas, the price of meth fell by a quarter from the early 80s to the middle of the decade. The stated goal of U.S. drug policy is to lower demand by increasing price. Reagan's drug war did precisely, oppos precisely the opposite, with pot as the lone exception. So, um, Now, to research this book, I didn't have to do, uh, do very much experimentation because there is plenty of uh, data available out there that you, can, uh, that you can sift through and plenty of people you can interview. But there, there was one drug that I felt like I had to, uh, I had to, I had to experience because no, the federal government doesn't uh, currently keep any statistics on it and it's, and it's a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, even though it's an ancient drug. I'm referring to ayahuasca. Now, around 2000-2001, uh, when the availability of acid pretty much vanished, you saw a rise in the, in the, in the use of other hallucinogens, such as uh, salvia, uh, what they call research chemicals, which are uh, you know, basically just uh, designer, you know, uh, synthicates of, uh, if synthicates is a word, of LSD. Um, mu uh, mushroom use actually stayed stayed pretty steady. You would have expected to see a little bit of a tick up uh, in that XD use went down a little bit. So it, a lot of your uh, real psychedelic fans were moving to uh, not, not into, the, into the lower level of psychedelics, but actually up into a higher level. Now, ayahuasca is, depending on who you ask, sort of legal. Now, the question of legality in, in, in a, uh, actually comes down to whether or not it's fun, uh, because if it's not fun, then the people doing it can qualify for some sort of religious exemption. But the, uh, the Supreme Court has decided that in America, if, if you're having fun, you can't be a religion. Um, so, and if you, and if you think, about, uh, think about the implications of that, it's, you know, you, they don't want a whole bunch of people getting together and throwing a party and saying, hey, this is a religion. So, there are a couple churches that are now arguing in the courts that, look, ayahuasca is not fun. It really isn't fun, therefore we should be able to take it. And uh, so I, I uh, took it myself to try to test out whether or not uh, it actually is fun and whether or not it should be legal. Now, the organized ayahuasca churches make up only a tiny fraction of American users. Most tend to imbibe no more than a few times a year in a friend's living room guided by a traveling shaman or in a joint like the industrial Brooklyn warehouse I traveled to in early 2007. I'd been asked not to reveal the name of the place because of, quote, complexities of the legality. Every few weeks, on Fridays and Saturdays, a shaman flies up from South America to lead ayahuasca sessions. Quote, the journey room is down and to your left, said a bearded man in his 20s as my wife, Elizanne, and I filed in. Plastic pitchers, vomit buckets, were stacked on a small table to the right. I grabbed a blanket with another stack. I grabbed a blanket from another stack, plopped down on a dilapidated mattress, and waited, the bucket in my lap. On a futon to my left were Zito and Eric, both from New York. They had been there before and suggested that writing while on the journey will be difficult at best. You should probably just go with it. Just let it happen, said Eric. The woman near them was also from the city. She'd never done ayahuasca, she said, but was there for exploration. The owner of the warehouse found me on the mattress to talk about a mutual friend who had vouched for me. Her first ayahuasca journey, he said, was here, and shortly after it, she sent, she sent him an email from Peru, where she was doing a week-long ayahuasca retreat. 
the owner, the veteran of several ayahuasca journeys, then gave me a brief resume that included both porn production and investment banking. He had quit caffeine, alcohol, meat, and anything that's been cooked. He mentioned that he'd been fasting for the past three days because doing so can help bring on a, quote, light journey. Quote, the dark ones are good too, but whoa, he said, shaking his head and shuddering. The first time that he took ayahuasca, he had a magical, euphoric experience. He credited, his he credited his healthy lifestyle and general goodness. Quote, I thought it was a sign of how well I was living my life that I could handle it like nothing, he said. Then the second time, I went straight to hell. Oh God, it was awful, but wonderful, of course. He reminded us to relax, to let go, and remember to breathe. Good luck, he concluded, finding a place against the wall. The warehouse now held 25 people, each of them having paid $200 cash for this gourmet psychedelic experience. There were, a, there were a middle-aged couple, a group of three women in their 20s dressed in pajama pants and sleeveless camis, and a frat guy with a magazine-worthy physique who'd already removed his shirt. Between the couple and the women was a makeshift shrine. The shaman, who comes up from Peru every few months with his metal thermos of ayahuasca, walked toward it and pulled out his guitar. He looked to be in his late 20s, and, as I'd later learned, he was born in Spain. He set down rules, no talking, no making noise that could interfere with someone else's journey, and offered advice, relax, let go, breathe. He said that there might be moments in which we feel that time is frozen, unable to move forward. We might feel as if we'll be on ayahuasca for eternity. He promised that these feelings would go away and that in several hours we would, just, we would feel just the way we do now, perhaps even better. One by one, the shaman sun summoned us to him. He poured a muddy beverage from his thermos into a metal shot glass. I downed it as he said, God bless you. I thanked him and walked back to my dingy mattress to wait, bucket ready. A slow wave of vomiting began to roll around the room. It wasn't looking good for the turkey sub I'd had at a rest stop on the way to the city, or for the bag of barbecue chips. In the spring of 2008, Hebrew University professor Benny Shannon, who claims to have used ayahuasca at least 160 times in the early 90s, speculated that Moses was on a variant of the brew created from plants available in the Middle East when he encountered God with fear and trembling. Quote, in advanced forms of ayahuasca inebriation, Shannon writes, the seeing of light is accompanied by profound religious and spiritual feelings. At about a half an hour in, Elizan pointed out that I was shaking, and I was, as if I were in a t-shirt in 15 degree weather. Breathe, she said. The shaking stopped, but whenever I didn't focus on submitting to the ayahuasca, it came back sometimes gaining strength and moving not just my arms, but my entire body. Jesus, said Elizan. Next to us, Zito started shouting, yes! He was dragged out, wailing incoherently. In high school and college and shortly thereafter, I'd probably eaten either acid or mushrooms more than 50 times, and some of the experiences had been out of this world powerful, but nothing had prepared me for ayahuasca. I had never been so far from reality. I could get back to the ground, sort of, by finding Elizan. I tried to tell her that I was on another planet, but words were extremely hard to form. I'm getting more, she said. As best I could, I begged her not to, wondering what would happen if both of us became this lost. She promised not to and got up anyway, but I didn't realize it until hours later. In the meantime, I was having conversations with people I know. The talks were so real that I didn't even stop, step outside of them to note how strange it was to be hallucinating an entire conversation. I just participated. Mostly, the people lectured me about my life, telling me about obligations and consequences. Then it got worse. I started, to experience, I started to experience the things I'd been reading and writing about as a political reporter. I was in a firefight in Baghdad, explosions and dead bodies all around. I was swept away by Hurricane Katrina, then trapped in a baking attic as the festering water rose. The suffering gave way to a conversation on power. I thought back to confrontations I'd had with people at or near the top of the congressional administ and administrative ranks and the stories I'd written that had made life difficult for them. This is, this is serious stuff, my unknown interlocutor told me. This is not a game. You're playing with some of the most powerful people on the planet, and I promise if you keep this up, they'll crush you. All trips lend themselves to melodrama. But for what seemed like an eternity, I felt as if I was being tortured by the power that I'd found myself reporting about, now unquestionably malevolent. Are you really up for this? Are you really willing to be ground to pieces? No, I finally conceded, I'm not. I vowed to switch careers and move to the suburbs if I made it back to DC, a promise I recanted immediately after the torture ended. 
I saw colors and objects and serpent-like demons and prayed to God that there actually is no God and no heaven because the thought of this experience lasting forever seemed unbearable. It was frightening to the bone. I would rather never have lived, I reasoned, than live a full, happy life followed by this in the afterlife. I prayed that when we die, we just die. And finally, I was down. I leaned over to Alizan and told her, I think I've decided I like drugs that are fun. So. Anyway, thank you. Any, uh, anybody have any questions about any parts of those uh, chapters? Where was that stat? $600. This is in the, uh, the, the Department of Justice puts out uh, uh, price and purity levels, uh, price and purity statistics. If you Google um, DEA price and purity, it, it ought to come up. There's a 2004 uh, RAND study that uh, that put together, um, you know, that that analyzed uh, cocaine uh, and other drug prices and purity going back to, I think '81 was was the first year, which is why I started there. Uh, now I, I filed a, I don't think this was in the party, right? I, fi I filed a Freedom of Information request to get data after 2004, and that request was rejected because I was told that there was no public benefit for those numbers. Now it turns out that they they had them all along and. In January, after uh, the Obama administration took over, the new drugs are just kind of quietly posted them online a after they had rejected this, this FOIA request a, a year earlier or so. I actually have a, a story about that that should be out in Reason Magazine in the next day or two. So now, y now you can get the numbers straight from um, 81 up until, up until today. Now, how reliable are they? You know, they're, they're government numbers. They, but the RAND Corporation you know, usually does good, pretty, pretty good policy work, and they uh, they say that they come from wire intercepts, uh, you know, e buys that they make, and and all they they combine all different information that they have about prices and and come up with this number. Now, the other funny thing about the, the numbers that the drugs are quiet quietly released is that they directly contradict uh, numbers that the drugs are in 07 and 08 had selectively released. He put out a few numbers representing like a couple months in 2007 said hey there's a price surge we must uh, be doing the right thing well the actual numbers came out and Rand said no actually they're going the opposite direction so the drug czar still has to explain you know how they were how they came up with numbers that showed prices going up when the Rand corporation studied the exact same data and found it going down so I, I would trust the Rand numbers much more than uh, than the drugs are, you know, selectively released numbers. So, do you have any ideas about why is America different in terms of drug use from these other countries? Um. Well, yeah. Um. Th there, it's it's seen. I I sometimes think of America like uh like a college freshman you know, who has been kept inside and, uh, you know, told that drugs are evil for 18 years and then uh, set off into the world. There's so little uh, understanding about drugs that when people do then start to get high, they don't, they don't know how to, you know, they don't know how to treat it, treat it responsibly. We had a huge, I don't know if you want to use the word epidemic, but we had a huge, um, a spike in cocaine use in the 1890s and nobody remembers that and so then when it came around again in the 1970s you had all these uh, educated people saying that there are no drawbacks to to cocaine now if, if there was a more rational relationship with drugs then a drug comes into society people learn that uh, people learn how to use it and they learn uh, what its what its consequences are and the, the number that they use in drug policy circles is seven years. That within seven years, a com everyone in a community will have been indirectly or directly confronted with some of the negative consequences of a drug. And so within, so toward the end of that seven year period, drug use either plateaus or starts coming down. And that's, that's what happened uh, with cocaine in the 1890s and again with crack in the 80s. It, it's, not, it's not policy, it's just human nature that, you s that people see the best drug education possible, a crackhead stumbling down the street, and they start to then make a rational decision about whether or not they want to they, you know, try it. Some people still will, but other people will have the, the evidence at hand that 
I probably shouldn't do that. But then the drug disappears completely, and so, and so we forget all about that. And the drug disappears completely because we have this virulent, very strong strain of uh, temperance, a temperance movement that's been alive since the 1830s, uh, at least. It actually, probably even going back, back further than that. But it really, it really rose, first of all, in the 1830s. And then as drinking went down in the 1830s, uh, opium use went up. So this, these trends go back hundreds of years. Yes, uh, I have I have a theory that I think is correct. Um, there, and it's it's three three things. Um, you had you had one guy who was allegedly producing a huge huge amount of the LSD, and uh, his his name's William Leonard Picard. He's and he's currently serving two life sentences for uh, for LSD distributing out in a federal prison in in California. I actually visited him out there, and I've been corresponding with him for about five years. Um, he's he's still appealing his case, and he still maintains some level of of innocence. But a lot of people that I talk to in the psychedelic subculture think that yes, it, they're right. He was he was making like a massive amount of the LSD, and the reason for that is that it's very hard to make a lot. Uh, it's hard to get an accurate recipe, and you have to be a, a, you have to be a really skilled chemist to make it, and there's not a whole lot of profit in it. Somebody. Uh, takes a hit of acid, they probably aren't going to want to take another hit of acid for a couple months or maybe even a couple years. Now, you can either make something that's <coughs> difficult to make, could land you in prison for your entire life, and is cheap, you know, like five bucks, ten bucks, or you can make something like ecstasy or meth, which is easier to make, and after somebody comes down from an ecstasy pill, they're like, hey, let's do that again, that was awesome. And it's 25 bucks a pop, so Unless, unless you're like evangelical about LSD, you're, you're going to shift to something where you're going to make more profit and have less, less risk. Now, at the exact same time that he was taken down, he came down in November of 2000, uh, Fish went on a two-year hiatus. And uh, Fish, actually, I, fa I found a, uh, uh, an FBI field report um, from either the 80s or 90s that I've mentioned in here that when the Grateful Dead came to a town for the next two or three months, psychedelic drug availability increased, according to all the uh, local, local arrests. So this was kind of like a roving psychedelic postal service that was going on. You know, Jerry dies, and then the you know, fish pick up the remnants of it. So you had that, and then you also had the, the, the fading out of these, of these giant raves, where you'd have thousands of uh, young people getting together in the middle of nowhere, or in, a ch in an abandoned church, or in a warehouse, and tripping all night, and a lot of these ravers had gone to the uh, to the parking lot where when the dead or fish came through, and they'd pick up you know a couple sheets, and uh, then they'd take them back, and and that's that was the main distribution network. It was it wasn't a you know they didn't have the, you don't have people uh, on the street corner you know slinging LSD. That's you, that's not how you're going to find it. So simultaneously, all three of those things came down. Uh, now, fish is making a comeback, so uh, you know that's one step in in a, in a revival. But you also then have to find someone who's who has the knowledge and is willing to uh, take the risk to do it to get back into it. You were mentioning was it in the 1890s? Was it cocaine use or something? Uh, yeah, you know, actually, all kinds of drugs at the time, but cocaine was one of them. Did anybody go to prison for it in those days, or was it all legal? People. And I, uh, Eric Sterling, who's um, a very smart um, drug policy uh, dude, uh, puts the number at about 500,000 drug related. Now, um, the federal government puts out a number that's something like 30,000. Um, but when you think about people in prison for drugs, it's kind of a complicated question because let's say you're arrested for joyriding and you do like a six month sentence. But then you have three years of parole after that. Now, during that three years of parole, you're not allowed to hang out with anybody who, ha who does drugs, and you yourself are not allowed to do drugs, which isn't a new law, but you're tested for it all the time. So 
you can go then to your PO and you can fail a drug test and then you do your the rest of your uh, your suspended sentence for joyriding and the, the federal government won't say that you're in prison for uh, for drugs they'll say you're in prison for joyriding but clearly you're if it w if drugs were legal you wouldn't have gotten locked up now in the 1890s um, no at first the, these uh, these drugs were all legal and and our prison population back then and really up till the 80s was was very marginal but but states around that time started to started you no know, towns and cities and states started to started to ban the drug so legalization has always come you know or prohibition has always come up through the states and just the same way that legalization now of medical marijuana and then of you know of marijuana for everybody c comes up through the states as well so it, it's uh, it, you know there are varying it depends on where you are. Same with alcohol. There's still, you know, counties where you can't get alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I read something by uh, somebody named Denson Gerber. Is that familiar with you? No. Well, the thing that she said was that drugs were used to enhance sex. And I know that Freud was taking cocaine to do that. And he had a vision that to this day is still going to be important. But he did it with cocaine. And I don't know enough about drugs to make any of the connections. I thought maybe with your experience you could say something. Uh, to, to, to Freud and... Uh, yeah, why was, or what, what happened to Freud that was so powerful? And it was, he had right. a very vivid experience. And I know that it was true. Yeah. The eight, yeah, the eight. That was in the late nineteenth century, and cocaine really was. It was the rage. Uh, you could buy it in a in Sears Roebuck's catalogs. It was. There was no thought whatsoever that that there was anything wrong with it, and and that's what happens with every drug that 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 came along. Um, you know, more when when morphine came in, it was a non non addictive synthetic alternative to laudanum or opium. That you know, so that people could take this and and not have a problem. When heroin came in, it was the exact same thing. It was a non-addictive alternative to morphine. Um, cocaine was, you know, something that'd give you, a, you know, a nice pep in your step and uh, all sorts of other benefits as well. But th there was there was such a reaction against it in the uh, in the early part of the 20th century that it was just essentially kind of wiped off the map for a while. And so it was only then in the 70s that it started coming back, and it was it was certainly tied to sex in the 70s as well. You're saying it is tied to sex. Sure. Point. Oh, yeah, sure. Cocaine, power, sex are all, you know, people think about those things. It's all, all combined. <laughs> I don't think marijuana, no. No, not so much. But maybe other people have different experiences. Yeah? Well, I was wondering if you have, you know, I, I'm not done with the book, and I'm really enjoying, like, you know, the bear heroin with a bear company that now does the bear aspirin, how it did the bear heroin, heroin first. But that I'd heard, and I'm also surprised at how often, like the, the uh, suffra suffragette movement was tied in with the temperance thing where people voted against the suffragette movement because they thought these women were just going to get the right to uh -huh. vote against alcohol. Right. And, and they were right. <laughs> and um, But I had been reading it, and maybe you addressed this too, how often in women's prisons at the turn of the last turn of the century, late 1800s, women put in solitary confinement to keep them quiet. They put them on laudanum or an opiate when they were in, you know, darkness and solitary confinement. That it was a good way to um, keep the people who were in solitary confinement quiet, and especially right. in women's. Do you know anything about that? Well, another. There, it's a matter of degrees, and it's in some sense, the another word for solitary confinement in the 1890s would have been marriage. Uh, and uh, in the uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, I have some of these ads in there. There, the pharmaceutical uh, companies specifically advertised their drugs to bored housewives. Um, the, the ads are the ads are hilarious. It's like you know, is, is, is your wife suffering from melancholy? And, fatigue and boredom, you know, give her some of this, I think dexedrine is one of the ads in there, and it'll really give her, like, you know, she'll really, it'll make her life worth living again, or, 
like they're re very very straightforward there's there's no like euphemism going on in that um, I don't I don't know about uh, the uh, that like putting them in prison and, and drugging them though I hadn't actually heard about that it wouldn't be totally surprising though where 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 could you find more about that what do you uh, I used to work for, uh, in 04 and 05, for a little less than a year, I worked for uh, the Marijuana Policy Project, which is the, the principal funder of uh, Students for Sensible Drug Policy. So we sort of worked for the same, uh, same place. Um, I, I think that it, from, from uh, my experience as a political journalist, I think it actually kind of lies to me a little bit uh, when I compare it to the uh, the history that, that I learned when, when writing this book. The way that drug laws have always changed throughout American history is, is from the bottom up. Um, but small towns would be the first, like San Francisco was the first one to ever pass, uh, ironically, a, uh, a, pro a, a prohibition law. When, uh, and it was specifically directed at Chinese. Like you could possess opium, uh, you could smoke opium as long as you were not Chinese. Um, and it was like written right into the law. Um, so then that, that travels from San Francisco, other, other towns, counties, and states hear about it, uh, they like it, and, and they enact it. And that this, that's the same way that I think that it's going to happen this time around. And right now in Montana, you can walk into a store and buy marijuana legally. In Denver, you can do it. Very soon in Rhode Island, you'll be able to walk into a compassion center, which is licensed by the state, show them your card, and walk out with marijuana. LA has a thousand clinics now, roughly a thousand. When I was out there uh, researching it maybe a year and a half ago, there was something like 400. And it's, it's just exploding. And so um, it, it comes from each city and state changing its law, and then eventually, um, the law changes at the federal government. And the way it tends to work at the federal level is that regardless of whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you're more likely to support um, m medical marijuana on, you know, on this annual vote that they have based on whether or not your state has legalized it. So the idea then is that the, the representatives from the state are not going to vote against uh, their, their, what the, the voters in their state have already enacted. So once you have more than 50% of the country living under medical marijuana laws, then Congress will, will come along. And you're close to that. You know, once you get uh, Illinois and New York, you're pretty, I think you're pretty much there, if, if, not, if not all the way there. And then you'll also pick up a, you know, uh, the random votes of some other members of Congress elsewhere. The, the goal that uh, the, the movement, that, as far as I understand it now, is not to get legalization passed at the congressional level, but to get a, a law passed that says states are allowed to make their own medical marijuana and marijuana laws without interference from the federal government. And then that, that, that's the thing that's in the way of allowing states like California, which will probably vote on it. If I had to gamble, I'd, I'd gamble that they're going to vote on it in 2010. They're trying to gather signatures for it now. And uh, they're going to, it's probably going to be on the ballot. So if California votes to legalize, where polls are showing that it, uh, it has more than 50% support, then that's, that's huge, especially with them suffering this massive budget deficit <coughs> and complete paralysis of government. It's hard to scoff at $2 billion in tax revenue. The, that, that's my estimate um, based on income, uh, payroll taxes, et cetera. The, the, the actual tax official who runs the state of California's tax uh, policy has estimated to be 1.3 billion in tax revenue. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a lot of money. So once that starts flowing, other people are going to want it, especially in times like this. So I think the best way to get things done is just to get them passed locally. I know DC is trying, so that's going to be that's going to be an interesting battle, whether or not Obama will prevent DC from from doing it, because it's overwhelmingly popular in DC. Anybody else? Both ends. The, I guess you answered the Obama administration. I guess that's the What about the founding fathers? Or the he asked about the uh, the founding fathers, um, and that's that's something that uh, you know people love to talk about. Did you know George Washington growing hemp? Uh, was it grown on the White House lawn? That sort of thing. It was, as best as I could tell, they didn't. Uh, it was more like ditch weed. They didn't really recognize its uh, its its psychoactive properties. Um, but it, I I also came across a lot of ads at the time, not, not at that time, but in the early 1800s for uh, patent medicines that had cannabis in them. So that leads me to believe that, you know, the numbers, something like five or 10% of patent medicines had cannabis in them. So, you know, somebody must have been doing it, um, but I couldn't find any record of it, of it being smoked. It seemed like it wasn't smoked until the uh, early 1900s when the Mexican revolution kind of unleashed this wave of immigration. Um, but I, my research is more 19th, 20th, and 21st century than, than 18th century, so I could be corrected on that, but that's, that's as best as I could find out about that. In my experience, it seemed like drugs or interesting drugs sort of disappeared with the issuance of the cabaret licenses. So have, the, have there been any studies to sort of see if there actually is a correlation between drug use and dancing? Um, and my second question is, you talked about salvia being a hallucinogen. Are you talking about the little plant with the red buds that's beautiful that grows? Is I have a whole bunch of it in my garden right down the street, and, I, and nobody's ever bothered to pick it. So, do people know that this That's is? That's probably a different kind of salvia. There's okay. tons of different kinds of salvia, and the one that um, will send you into outer space um, is called salvia divinorum, okay. um, you know, for divine. So, so um, I'm not going to have to hide my plants from passersby. And it's totally legal. So okay. somebody would be a fool to, to cut your plants up when they can go to a, a head shop or go online and order it extremely cheaply um, and get it in uh, the actual plants themselves I've never done it myself that uh, the actual plants themselves though apparently you have to smoke a whole bunch of them for it to work so you want to get extract which you get um, you know it's you know just watered down uh, a variety of it so I think your your salvia is probably safe I think you're safe. Yeah, if somebody somebody wants, and that's that's the other thing about uh, you know making a drug legally available. What's the you know, you can just go online and get it, or go to a shop and get it, so you don't have to, you know, commit a misdemeanor of uh, ripping your ripping your pretty plants up. You know. And uh, dancing and drugs. Um, have you been to a fish show? <laughs> those those people are clearly not. Uh, you know, um, expert dancers. So, uh, yeah, no, and, and there they are getting down. So, before, um, before Giuliani issued the cabaret license, there were a ton of clubs all around this neighborhood. And you could get pretty much any drug that you wanted, and you were fine. Then the drug, the dancing clubs kind of closed down, and it became much more difficult to try. Oh, oh that connection. Yeah, I think that's, th that's the same dynamic you're talking about that I was talking about with raves. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So is it like if you dance badly, then you can have drugs? But if you no, dance they shut well, those. They you shut can't the, have They drugs? shut those down too. Yeah. So is it that if you dance well, then you're more likely to be targeted for drug use, and your venue for dancing will be shut down? I think if you dance, you dance in general, you're likely to be targeted. So. <laughs> so. Yes, about two months ago, I was in Boston, criminal laws and talking about jails and the statistic that amazed me, I knew in energy 
we're 4% of the population and use 25% of the world's energy. But I didn't know that we're 4% of the world's population and we have 25% of the people in jail in the world. It's in the United States. And that he was out there and redoing that. I know that they're discussing it down in D.C. And I know that you are a senior correspondent with the Huffington Post on the Senate and the House. And you socialized with a lot of the staff from the senators and the congressmen. So that now that you've come out with this book that you're promoting and going around the country and talking about, is how are they treating you? What's the effect now that you are the spokesperson for drug policy? They, they treat it, you know, uh, mostly like a lot of people that work right in the mainstream treat drugs, which is kind of as a joke, although, you know, although a lot of them do it themselves. Um, for, for example, uh, just today, um, I got an email from uh, John Boehner, you know, the Republican leader's uh, spokesman. Uh, he, he sent me an article that was critical, uh, critical of Obama, and uh, he wanted me to highlight it uh, on uh, Huffington Post, and he, and he said, Grim, you should light this up, and I don't mean what you're thinking. <laughs> um, so, you know, they, like, it, it's a lot of that stuff. Uh, they, you know, and drugs are funny, you know, you know, um, in a lot of ways. But the consequences, uh, the imprisonment, are, are are not funny. But um, sometimes you can go both ways. The people who are in the drug policy reform, you know, get angry about every pun headline. But uh, you know, y there's nothing you can do about that. People are going to make puns constantly. That's that's uh, that that's like a uh, just a constant factor in drug policy. But the coverage has uh, been been changing and getting a lot more serious and you know more credible of the opposition arguments. So I haven't uh, been back there much since the book just came out, but I am looking forward to seeing uh, you know seeing what the reaction is. And a, a so, some people have kind of reached out to me. Um, the the annoying side of it is staffers and reporters who need to get hooked up. You know, they, they knew I was writing a book on drugs, so they'd uh, they'd come to me for that. But I'm hoping that the same thing happens in, in like policy, like um, that they that they come to me because they know that it's something that we'll take seriously and we'll write about. And that's what I'm hoping the Huffington Post can do is that it because it drives so much traffic to other sites, it, it can it can I've seen it influence what other um, what other websites or and what other media outlets write about because they want to try to get. Um, you know, played highly up on our site, and the same with uh, some staffers. I've seen them kind of tailor what uh, their their congressman's message is, so that we'll write about it and highlight it. Because then, you know, they get thanked by their boss. Their boss gets his name out there. He, he probably gets on MSNBC. Um, so, it, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what what the reaction is. Um, I didn't pull any punches in this in this book, so you know, we'll see. Um. Well, the, the uh, when I wrote about this last week or the week before, the the, uh, the UN drug czar uh, put out a report about a week ago saying that uh, it, it had been a, a, a big success so far, which was surprising because they had been extremely critical of, of Portugal's policy when it was enacted several years ago, saying that it might be in violation of, of some treaties, it was going to it was going to create uh, drug tourism and lead to all these other problems. Um, their their study of it so far has been that um, it's been it's been a, it's been a success. Crime's gone down. Addiction has not gone up. There's been there's been no drug tourism because it's not outright e it's not outright legal. You can't go to a shop and buy it, and you could still get a ticket and have to go to a, some kind of magistrate and explain yourself. And so a tourist doesn't want to have to go through all that hassle, you know, just just to smoke some hash, um, when they can go somewhere else to do that or stay at home. Um, so it, it seems like it's been pretty successful, and with the UN imprimatur, uh, you would you would think that some other countries are going to start start looking at that. Maybe one more question. If anybody has one. Drug policy because just in, in, in the small amounts of 
personal research that I've done, it seems a lot like drug policy is often not only shaped by, you know, oh, this drug is being used frequently and there's a lot of addicts to it and this drug is, you know, but, but it's also shaped by, by, you know, other, for instance, economic factors and, and you know, sort of, you know, you, you, you mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of other things have right. been bearing on drug policy and I wonder if you can... Yeah, I think I think there are two two key things that that influence drug use, and they're extremely obvious ones. One is availability, and the other is either the stigma or you know the attitude of of a country toward it. And av availability, it's like it's the overlooked um, obvious thing that leads to drug use. When a drug is more available, more people end up doing it. Um, one example is uh, is NAFTA. <laughs> Both the uh, both the the Bush and the Clinton White Houses told their told their uh, their people that they could not talk about drug policy in terms of NAFTA because getting it through Congress was going to be so difficult that if they talked about what impact it was going to have on the drug trade, then they might lose the the couple votes that they needed to get it to get it over the top. So it was a complete blackout um, in the late 90s. You know, administration officials start mention you know. It wasn't covered much, but they mentioned, yeah, like we weren't allowed to talk about uh, what it would do to the the uh, uh, drug trade. One one official called it uh, a deal made in narco heaven. Um, you know, you open up the border and two thousand trucks a day are, are pouring over it, and you know this is a policy that has nothing to do on the surface with uh, drug policy, but it it leads to the availability of of more drugs and then the the use of more drugs. And it came in tandem with uh, the tightening of the California border and the crackdown on the domestic meth uh, industry. So it had pushed meth down into Mexico. Then you cut off the kind of California corridor. It pushes me meth uh, transportation over into the Texas area and then straight up into the Midwest. And I found a 99 uh, Department of Justice report that even acknowledged that, that, that that's what happened. That, and that's, that's kind of how meth wound up um, getting into the Midwest. It, was, it wasn't like the Mexican cartels were like, you know what we really need to do is hit Cleveland. <laughs> like, they were forced that direction. And they, they, you know, they took the easiest path. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, let's say you want to uh, partner up with a, a team of Nicaraguans who also happen to be in the drug trade. You might consider your partnership with them more important than the impact it's gonna, that, that partnering with them is going to have. So, there are the examples go all the way through it, which is why I, I argue in the book that there really is no such thing as, as drug policy as 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 we um, attempt to implement it because it's it's constantly put in the back seat and overwhelmed by everything else. So, uh, thank you so much for coming out here. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> and if you didn't get enough, I'll be at the tank on Wednesday which is, what, on the west side? Where is that? Chelsea. Anybody know? Somewhere Chelsea, the tank. You can Google it, or you can email me. I'm easy to find. So thanks a lot. <laughs>